Hello, everyone. This is Gabrielle speaking. Can you hear me? <laughs> I hope so. Um, anyway, I want to say hello and welcome everybody to uh, our webinar on the global audiobook market today. Um, I'm Gabrielle Echeverry. I'm the manager of digital, pub digital publishing and international markets, and I'm just here to help facilitate uh, this morning's webinar. Um, thanks very much for, for joining us today. The presentation should take about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, and we'll have about a half hour at the end for questions. Um, we'll be taking questions via the Q&A function in WebEx. It's the right uh, of your screen. Uh, and so you're free, feel, please feel free to submit any questions uh, you might have as uh, our presenter, Michelle, is speaking. Um, and she'll go through them uh, after her presentation and, and begin to answer them when we reach the Q&A session. If any of you have any problems or have questions relating to WebEx as the presentation um, is unfolding, please message me uh, as the host via the chat function in WebEx. So again, that should be on the right uh, of your screen, um, and you can, you can open it there. It's a different box from the Q&A uh, box for those of you who might not uh, be familiar with this. Um, at the end of the webinar, we'll ask that you fill out our evaluation form. Your feedback is extremely important to us and, of course, to the Canada Book Fund. So if you could take a few moments afterwards to uh, fill out a few questions, it shouldn't take very long, uh, we would be very uh, grateful. So now that we have that out of the way, I'd like to take a moment to introduce uh, our host or our presenter today. Um, I'm very pleased to present to you Michelle Cobb. Uh, she's a partner at Forte Business Consulting. Uh, Michelle is a frequent speaker at conferences, workshops, events, and panels, and she's a recognized expert in the audio publishing industry. She began her audiobook career as Assistant Managing Director for LA Theatre Works, where she's currently Director of Audio Publishing. Um, and she went on to become Vice President of Sales and Marketing for the British Broadcasting Corporation Audiobooks Division. She has served on the Audio Publishers Association Board since 2001 and is currently Executive Director. She is a well-known provider of PR, sales, marketing, and business development services. Uh, th through uh, Forte Business Consulting, and she's also a publisher of both Audiophile Magazine and NM MMB Media LLC. Um, and so for those of you who are interested in this topic, in 2018, Legal Canada Books will be producing a bilingual report on the global audiobook market that will be co-written by Michelle and her business partner, Mike Desrosiers. Um, so please uh, keep, you know, stay on the lookout for that. We'll let you know for sure when, when it's ready for publication and ready to be shared. Um, and so for now, I'll hand over the controls to Michelle so we can get started. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. Uh, it's exciting to be here. I've actually been in the audio publishing world for about 20 years now. And I remember back at the start of my time in audiobooks where I would say the word audiobook and tell people what I did, and they wouldn't know what I meant. So I would have to explain, oh, it's a book on tape. Maybe you've taken out a cassette from the library to listen to in your car. And I would have to go through this elaborate explanation to make them understand exactly what I did. At that same time, emerging divisions of audio book publishing within the book world were struggling within their own organizations to get recognition for the format. And new and interesting independent audio publishers were starting to emerge and really take the world by storm. Today, when I say the word audiobook, everyone knows exactly what I mean. They generally will talk to me about the latest book that they've been listening to and where and how they've been listening. So things have really changed for us as an industry. We are, in fact, a bright light amongst publishing right now with really extreme uh, numbers of revenue and unit sales growth. So I am excited to talk to you about all this today. There will be a lot covered within this hour. And as Gabrielle said, I really encourage you to put your questions into that Q&A box as we go along uh, so you don't forget them. So let's take a look at where we are in the industry today. Well, for the past five years, we have seen double-digit growth in revenue. And the last two years, 
uh, between 2014 and 2016, the Audio Publishers Association in the U.S., their yearly sales survey has showed almost 20% growth each year uh, in revenue. Additionally, between 2015 and 2016, there was almost a 34% growth in the number of units sold. In fact, between 2012 and 2016, the number of units sold per year has almost doubled. So what is happening that's bringing all this to the forefront? Well, first of all, we're seeing increased production by all sorts of new publishers entering the market, by the standard you know, established publishers actually increasing their production, and we're seeing a lot more places where you can actually sell audiobooks. And of course, the rise of digital has meant that there are a lot more options for where and how people can listen. So in 2016, the Audio Publishers Association of the U.S. actually estimated that the sales throughout North America were $2.1 billion. That's what customers are actually spending on audiobooks. So with these increased sales and this increased awareness, what we're finding, especially in the digital world, is that people care very much about content, but not as much about format. They're looking to find a particular title or a book on a particular topic, and they're willing to try it as a print book, as an ebook, and also as an audiobook. And with this emergence of digital, we've certainly seen that younger listeners are coming into the fold. So let's dive in a little bit uh, to the overall environment and we'll come back to talk specifically about what's happening with younger listeners in the world of digital. So I am really proud to be part of this cycle of growth. And we have a wonderful circle here that really talks about all the elements of what's happening today. First of all, with this increase in sales, we have a lot more increase in press. And authors are noticing the revenue of their audiobooks increasing. So they are really coming to their publishers and saying, can you please make sure that you do my books in audio? If they're working with an agent who has sold the audio rights separate from the print rights, they're encouraging those agents to make sure those audio rights are getting utilized. And if all else fails and no one actually records the audio version of the title, they're doing it themselves. Now, with more authors becoming aware of the format, they're allowing us to be a bit more experimental, and they're bringing new types of titles, new subject matters into the fold. And so what happens when you have more authors talking about this, more press talking about this, more subject matters being available in the audio format, you start to gain more listeners. And as we gain more listeners, more people are starting to record audio. So we have an emergence of small independent audio publishers, and the large independent audio publishers are gathering up some of the smaller companies and really growing uh, and producing more. Within those additional publishers, we're starting to see some interesting trends. For instance, 20 years ago, not many people made their living as an audiobook narrator. Today, many people do this full time. And when they read five or six or eight books a month, they start to realize, hey, there might be a title or two that I haven't seen done in audio that I would think would do really well in this format. And they're starting to even publish a few of those titles on their own. So everyone's really getting into the game. Certainly big retailers like Audible have their own publishing programs established. Everybody is making more, and this increase in titles, this increase in availability, this increase in talking about the format has led to that excellent increase in sales. Now, approximately every other year, the Audio Publishers Association works with an outside company to do a big consumer survey. In 2015 and 2017, they've been working with Edison, uh, which does a lot of research in smart speakers, podcasts, 
uh, and they've really become experts in audio in all forms. In fact, their surveys have been so useful that they'll be doing several different surveys in 2018. They'll be doing focus groups and also another digital survey uh, to talk about what's happening with the listeners. In 2015 and 2017, the consumer survey showed a big increase in the number of young people listening. And in fact, in 2017, you can see from this diagram, a full 52% of listeners were actually 45 and were 44 and under. So it's young listeners who are trying that digital format, who are listening on their smartphones, that are helping to drive this growth. When I started in the industry and we used to do these consumer surveys, your typical listener was a female who had above average income and was college educated uh, and generally, you know, over 50. Today's listeners come cut across a wide swath. We have 14% of listeners being between the ages of 18 and 24, and 20% in the growing piece that is 25 to 34 age range. These tend to be people who might have a little bit more time on their hands, who might have a little bit more free income, and they're starting to get into listening. And when we see people come into listening at a young age, they generally stick with the format. So once we can get people to listen, we tend to keep them for life, which is fantastic. Now, obviously, there's something big that's happening in the world of audio, which is podcasts. And in fact, Edison's survey showed that 44% of regular podcast listeners are 35 years or younger. So again, people who are listening to podcasts also tend to listen to audiobooks. Uh, in fact, research has shown that podcast listeners are much more likely to listen to an audiobook than a non-podcast listener, and that a podcast listener will typically listen to twice as many audiobooks as just an audiobook listener who does not listen to podcasts. So there's a lot of synergy in between the formats, and we're certainly seeing podcasts like S-Town and Serial which are very much like an audiobook in their format, sending people over to listen to an audiobook and people going back and forth. Okay, so let's take a look at the production explosion. This is, of course, driving a lot of growth. Again, about uh, you know 20 years ago, in general, the audio publishers produced between two and 3,000 titles a year. We started to see a massive expansion in 2012 uh, when we went from doing about 7,000 titles a year the year prior to about 16,000 titles. In 2013, all the reporting publishers showed that about 24,000 titles were being re released. Not a big leap in 2014, only to 26,000, but in 2015, we went all the way to 36,000 titles. And then in 2016, we took a huge leap to 51,000 audiobook titles produced. There is no indication in 2017 that things are slowing down. So what happened to bring about this explosion? Well, first of all, all the publishers starting, started to produce more. But then we also saw the emergence of the Audiobook Creation Exchange, or ACX, where self-published authors could produce their own audio and small companies could get their audio made without having a fully established program. So that really sent things into overdrive. So all this explosion of growth, all this explosion of revenue, you might be thinking, well, hey, maybe I should start my own audio program. So the first thing you want to consider and think about is your rights. There are a lot of factors here. First of all, genre. Um, about 75% of the audiobooks each year are produced in fiction, and about 20 to 25% are produced in nonfiction. The biggest genres that customers self-select as being their favorites are mystery, suspense, thriller in fiction, fantasy and science fiction, and romance. 
In the areas of nonfiction, we see history, biography, memoir, and self-development titles being on top. So you're going to want to take a look at your catalog and say, okay, do I have titles in a genre that does really well? Those are probably something to look at starting with. Also, where am I going to release my titles? We'll talk a little bit about territory later, but as you think about your titles, if you know you're going to be releasing a lot of titles in the world, you might want to be aware that children's titles do really well in Germany and full cast recordings do really well in Germany. Full cast recording is when you have different narrators reading the different parts. Oftentimes there's sound effects and music, and many times these titles are adapted. Both children's and these full cast recordings are still a small part of the U.S. market, but we're starting to see more production in these areas, and so we expect to see some growth. If you are going to be releasing a lot of titles in the UK, humor is really hot in the nonfiction area in the UK. In places like Sweden, erotica does really well. It may not do as well in some other countries. For instance, there are a lot of emerging retailers in the Arab market, and they may or may not respond well to erotica. So you want to think about these things as you are thinking about your program as a whole. The next element is length, and this was a surprising element. Uh, many years ago, we did a focus group with the Audio Publishers Association, and people in the focus group kept talking about how length was important to their selection process. They have a commute of six hours per week, so they want to find a book that is six hours long. They know they're driving from Maine to California, they're going to be in the car for two days, and they're looking for two 12-hour books or a 30-hour book to get them through that trip. The average audiobook is seven to nine hours, and if your materials happen to be significantly shorter, you have to think about does your market have an interest in shorter titles, and can you do things like bundling them together to create interesting content? One of the questions I often get is, are people abridging titles anymore? Well, this was very popular when audiobooks were on their initial rise in the 90s. Today, less than 4% of sales is in the abridged format. We tend to see abridgments be from the larger authors, uh, and the publishers are making short and inexpensive CD titles for the big box stores that are looking for a, a lower price point. Of course, length had a big impact on products that were in hard goods. Cassettes have a certain time frame. CDs are only about 78 minutes long. So if you have a title that is 85 minutes, how are you going to break that up on CD? These are all things you need to think about when you're thinking about length. Obviously, in a digital world, length becomes less important in some ways. One of the things that's happened in terms of length is that one of the big retailers sells off a credit system. And so if someone pays $15 for a credit, they want to look for value. And they'll often say, hey, this book is only three hours long. It only is $10. That's less than what my credit is. So I'm going to look for something to use my credit on that's longer and maybe buy that shorter title a la carte. So what about material? Well, obviously, does your book work in audio? If it's a book with a lot of photographs, it may not do so well. Are there a lot of pictures, charts, and graphs that make it difficult to understand if it's just being read to you? Those are all things that you'll have to think about as you're evaluating your catalog. And then, of course, pronunciation issues. Are there a lot of place names from foreign countries, or does someone have a, an interesting accent you need to know how to do? These are all things that you want to look at before you put a book into production. Of course, current topics are very interesting. Uh, you know, there are certain books right now that might not do so well. If you had a great book from your backlist about, you know, Obama's 
election in 2008, that might not be the first title you want to put in your list today because it is not going to have as much interest in 2017. The other things that you'll need to consider within your catalog are channels. Are your audio rights covering both libraries and retail? And are there certain titles that will do better in the library world than the retail world? Are there certain reference type materials that are evergreen in the library? You definitely want to look at your own catalog and how it's doing in print and ebook, uh, and you'll find that there's a lot of correlation. It doesn't mean that you're not going to see titles that didn't do so well in ebook do really well in audio, uh, but generally it can be a good guide for getting you started. And of course, where can you make your titles available? More and more of the emerging retailers are coming out in new corners of the world, and the existing retailers are opening new places, uh, and you've certainly seen that here in Canada. Uh, Kobo recently launched their audio store, and Audible has launched in Canada as well. Now, when you give your titles to those retailers, they also sell in England, in Japan, all these different places. So if you have world rights on a title, you'll be able to um, get the most revenue and sales potential from it. Foreign language rights are being talked about a lot these days. Specifically when it comes to French, audiobooks are still a very small piece of the publishing market in France, but there are 80 million French speakers worldwide. They just happen to be spread out across the globe. So working with retailers who have availability in a number of different locations is important to what you do. More and more we're starting to see requests for foreign language materials. Um, certainly Spanish is something that has been tried in audio before, but it's only recently that this has become more successful. Some of the major publishers, including Penguin Random House and HarperCollins are, and Scholastic, are starting to produce a fair number of titles in Spanish. It's always been very difficult uh, to decide which accent you're going to use. You're going to use a narrator from Mexico or Bolivia or Spain. These are things that you're going to have to think about when it comes to recording audiobooks in French as well. Um, you'll really want to have a close look at emerging retailers who can sell your titles in a particular area. Uh, certainly in Spain, we've seen the emergence of Storytel Spain, and that's a great example where the retailer comes in, makes available Spanish titles, and publishers respond um, by making more titles available in Spanish. All right, let's take a look at publishing patterns and how you should think about establishing your own audio program. There's really a number of ways you can do it. Of course, the first thing you can do is work on selling your audiobook rights uh, to an existing audio publisher. In Canada, you have Novel Audio, Post Hypnotic Press, Podium Publishing, all of whom are regularly producing a number of audiobooks and are always looking for new titles to acquire. There's also many small and medium-sized and large publishers of audio in the U.S. who are looking for titles. People like Blackstone Publishing, Brilliance, and Recorded Books publish thousands of titles a year. And as long as you have U.S. and Canadian rights and hopefully world rights, um, they would potentially be looking for your titles. If you want to establish your own publishing program, there's a couple of different ways that you can do it. I highly recommend when you start taking a look at working with an, a studio that does production. They can help you cast your title, get familiar with how to create the various formats that the retailers will need, and kind of understand the market a bit. Uh, if you're comfortable with doing your own program a little bit more in-house, um, you could work with a do-it-yourself platform such as ACX or as Findaway Voices. In both of those cases, the organization can help you create your title and also distribute it to various places. And Gabrielle has very kindly put the link to the Audio Publishers Association Getting Started page in the chat box 
this gives you a list of organizations that are uh, studios to help you produce your title or do-it-yourself platforms and distribution platforms. You have lots of different choices today that you didn't have five years ago. If you create your title and want to keep it simple and just have one point of distribution, you could go to someone like Authors Republic where they will distribute your, your title to 30 different retailers. Lots of options and things to consider. You can also work directly with audiobook narrators. Many narrators today actually record in their homes. They have a home studio set up, and from there you could work with them to record the title and also potentially to edit it. Many narrators have the established relationship with an editor so that they can have a second person on board with them, or you can hire a freelance editor separately. I always recommend you have a different person involved in the process of recording. You have to pick a good narrator and you also need to pick a good editor. That person should be listening to the title, following along with the text word for word, making sure that the narrator made no mistakes, and if they did make a mistake, sending them what we call a pickup list uh, so that they can correct those mistakes. That editor should also be able to format it for you so that it's ready for sale. Lots of different things to consider in this. But of course, the most important element is picking the right voice, making sure that you have someone who can handle the accents that you need and someone who is skilled at doing things like switching from character to character. When working with a professional studio, they will take your script and actually usually help you have some casting choices. You can give them a little bit of background about who the characters are and what you're looking for from the recording, and they can give you three or four different narrators to select from. Do-it-yourself platforms can work similarly where you can ask people to audition or even working directly with the narrator, you can ask them to audition. Most of these people who do this full time, they are freelancers, so we just really encourage you to respect that time. You shouldn't need 30 minutes of a uh, sample, just a few minutes to get an idea if that narrator has the right vocal tone and skill to be able to do what you are looking for. Lots of options for outsourcing portions of the tasks and lots of options for becoming experts in-house. Uh, a lot to think about with audio that's very different than text, uh, but it's kind of fun to learn. We definitely recommend that you look at starting with your strongest authors when you're establishing your own program. Again, if someone sells well in ebook and print, they're very likely to sell well in audio. And something that's very different in the market today is simultaneous release. So when something comes out in audio, we like it to come out in print at the same time and vice versa. That gives your listening and reading public the opportunity to choose the content in the format that they prefer at that moment. And it can help you with your marketing. There's no reason not to try and do simultaneous if you are planning in advance. Many people ask about, well, I've started this program, I want to start with my biggest authors, but you know, this particular series is on book 14. Should I release book 14 simultaneous with the ebook uh, and then go back and do the series? And yes, that's certainly what I recommend. Try to do your new titles first, and then if they do well, you can easily go back and fill in that series. As you fill in that series, you have a lot of things to think about with audio. Should you be using the same narrator? Types of decisions like that that are new to this particular format are things you're going to want to spend some time on. And of course, is there um, opportunity for the backlist? Well, absolutely. When you're thinking about backlist, obviously that first selection might be to think about subrights opportunities, but you have the opportunity to kind of mix and match between the two. Maybe selling off some subrights, maybe doing some on your own. The first thing that you'll really want to do is prioritize what has done well in print. 
doesn't mean that every time you're going to see a book do really well in print and also really well in audio. For a long time, people were looking for a particular percentage. If it sells X in print or ebook, will it sell Y in audio? The 10% rule was used a lot when we were working with CDs. It doesn't really hold as true in a di digital world. Uh, again, we'll see some titles that do really well in audio that don't do as well in ebook and vice versa. But your most recognizable authors are going to have the most chance of doing well. Uh, so start with them. Certainly subject matter, again, looking at genre, looking at current topics, and trying to pick the things that have the widest appeal, specifically in the market that you are looking at. So the U.S. market is the biggest market, and if you've got a mystery, I definitely say try that first. Then obviously you have those subrights opportunities. Can you be selling off a portion of your list uh, and keeping a portion of it? That can help balance out the revenue that will be required to actually produce your own audiobooks. It's not inexpensive to make an audiobook, and I think a lot of people when they're starting out are looking for the cheapest option. You know, that's certainly something that you want to consider because the cheapest option isn't always the best option. It is worth spending the time and effort to get a really good recording. You know, the listener is discerning enough to know if there's a dog barking in the background or if someone repeats a line and it is not edited out. Um, these are things that have really happened in audiobooks. Uh, so you want to work with people that know what they're doing and really spending some time and effort and energy on finding a good editor is going to help you. There's also, of course, lots of opportunities for partnerships. Um, independent audio publishers will often work with a particular publisher to look at their list very carefully and you know try to find things that are going to do well on their audio list. Uh, so develop those relationships with independent audio publishers as you're looking at establishing your own program because they might um, want to try something a little bit more experimental than you might do. Uh, and there can be lots of opportunities and learning from them as well. So in talking about territories, um, we do definitely see the largest market being in North America, specifically in the U.S. Um, so that's a great place to start and looking at their genres. Uh, the Canadian market is not as established um, with audiobooks, but I don't believe that it's going to be very, very different in terms of what you see with genres like mystery, suspense, thriller, and history, biography, memoir being at the top of the list. Now, if you have an existing ebook chain and you work with vendors that can deliver ebooks, this can be a really important relationship for you in audio as well. There are vendors like Ingram, like Firebrand Technologies that deliver both audio and ebook assets. And when you get into audiobooks, we'll talk a little bit more about metadata as we move along, but there's not a lot of standards. So having someone that could deliver the audio art and uh, metadata assets for you via an Onyx feed uh, can really make your life a lot easier. And as we keep saying, world rights titles have the most potential revenue. Um, so when you're thinking about your backlist, using that as a initial guide can be really helpful. So what we see with expanding consumers um, becoming aware of the format is that they're looking for a wider variety of titles. Uh, this gives you an opportunity to hedge your bets by trying different things. Uh, you know, you have a lot of romance in your collection, try that. You've got a little bit of erotica in your collection, try that. Be surprised how well it does in audio. Um, consumers are getting very interested in being on the go 
but also at relaxing at home with audio. This is something that we've seen in our surveys uh, with the Audio Publishers Association for about 10 years now, that people are interested in using audiobooks not just to be in the car, but also to relax at home. So are there titles that would be interesting for people to, you know, chill out with as they're sitting with their feet up on their couch. There's also lots of different business models that people are purchasing in. We used to see that in retail it was largely a credit model. We're starting to see the emergence of streaming services and even unlimited streaming options, more in that Netflix model. Again, this can bring new consumers to the format and they have a wider range of titles that they want to listen to. They might be willing to listen to shorter titles in that model or something that is uh, a bit more off the beaten path. So it can give you more opportunities to sell your titles that are a little bit different. Obviously, the biggest problem in any digital sales world is how does someone discover your title? You're going to work with your retailers and your aggregators to try and market your titles to their specific audience. But one of the big factors we see in discoverability for audio is people listening from the library. This can be a great place to launch a new author, and it can be a great place uh, for people to realize that there are some titles out there uh, that they hadn't been willing to necessarily buy, but they're willing to try uh, when they're taking it out of the library. So that can be really helpful to people in their launch. So where are we go going? Well, lots of gr good news in general. More growth, more people producing. We're starting to see a lot of celebrity participation. Certainly books like Tina Fey's Bossy Pants. It's really great to listen to her in her own voice telling you her story. But not just in reading their own biographies. We're also starting to see big name stars like Reese Witherspoon participate in big campaigns. So again, bringing more people to the format. She read the prequel to To Kill a Mockingbird, and that certainly has the potential to bring in new listeners. A lot of the growth that's happening has come from efficiencies in production. It seems really silly to say, but we actually save a lot of time by not having to photocopy a title and FedEx it to a narrator. Now a narrator can receive the title in a PDF or Word format. They can make notes in the margins. And when we actually record, because people are recording at home, uh, it cuts down on their travel time. And because they're not flipping the pages, uh, there can be less to edit. So all of these things have really helped push stuff forward. We see a lot of different marketing happening. Um, many of the big publishers are doing billboard campaigns and working with running associations or crafting associations. Uh, but we also see the use of video to market audio a lot. The Audio Publishers Association did a big campaign for uh, 2016 that involved people like Whoopi Goldberg, Chelsea Clinton, and Stephen King talking about why they loved audiobooks. And then we did a lot of advertising on social media. Certainly mobile has really pushed things forward. Now instead of having to carry around a box of CDs, you can have 10 titles on your smartphone that goes everywhere with you. And you can be listening as you're waiting in line at the grocery store. The two big things that are coming down the pike are new retailers entering the market that are really trying to price down the audiobook. It's a lot more expensive to produce an audiobook uh, than it can be to produce an ebook in terms of you have to hire a narrator, hiring an engineer, uh, an editor, all these people involved in the process make the production costs much more than you would see in some of the other formats. So audiobooks have typically been priced more expensively uh, than the print or the ebook. New retailers are coming into the market really want to see a drop in price, and it will be interesting to see how their emergence impacts uh, the sales. Also, one of the 
funny things that's happened is the emergence of home devices, Google Home, Amazon Echo. In 2015, this was not a factor, but the consumer survey in 2017 showed that 19% of audiobook listeners had actually listened on a home device or a smart speaker. We expect that uh, this Christmas is going to be a big one where more people are bringing these devices into their home, and we certainly think that people will be doing a lot of audiobook listening. In fact, HarperCollins Christian and the BBC have all done uh, titles and content specific for home devices, so I think we're going to see some more of that. All right, so now you're ready to get into content distribution. So many things to think about here. Uh, let's start with the making of an audiobook. I, I can never emphasize enough, I've talked about it a little as we've gone along here, the choice of narrator is going to be key. That can make or break your title. The gender of the narrator, if it is a first person female book, you probably don't want to cast a male to read that title. If you have two first person perspectives, one male, one female. Oftentimes today we hear half the book read by a female and half the book read by a male. In terms of a third person perspective book, usually it's read by one narrator and they do all the different characters. So making sure that the person you are working with to record it is comfortable moving back and forth between the characters and doing all the accents you need will be key to success. One of the big questions we always get is, what about the author reading their work? Well, this can be a great choice, or it can not be the greatest choice. Um, with fiction books, authors don't necessarily understand the rigors of recording. It is physically taxing to actually sit there and be still, uh, to make good choices in what you're wearing in terms of clothing, and to really watch things like, is my stomach growling? Uh, these can all be really intense uh, experiences when you're recording. If someone has not actually recorded an audiobook before, especially in the fiction genre where they have to play lots of different characters, their chance of recording efficiently uh, goes way down. Generally, a professional audiobook narrator spends two hours in the studio recording for every one finished hour of recording. It's a two to one ratio. When you get into someone who's inexperienced, you're going to see more like a three hour in the studio to every one hour or even four hours. So again, it's not a very efficient process. Oftentimes, authors who are nonfiction authors can make a good choice uh, to read their works. Um, but again, it can be surprisingly difficult for them to stand in front of a microphone. It's not like doing a book reading at a bookstore, and it's not like you know giving a speech. It's a very, very different skill, and you'll want to make sure that you're working with a studio uh, that can support them in making the best product possible. The other things that you want to consider when you're making an audiobook are enhancements. Do you want music? Do you want sound effects? All those things can impact the length of time it takes to make a recording and also the price. I see there's a question uh, in the chat box, which is, what is the average fee for doing a good quality audiobook? It really is all over the map. Um, you'll see on these do-it-yourself platforms and with studios, a wide range of pricing. So you'll want to become comfortable with the narrator or the vendor uh, that you're working with to find, you know, you sort of want to have a budget in mind as you go in. Generally, everything is figured on per finished hour. So if your title is 10 hours long and you've worked with that studio to get a rate of $500 per finished hour, you'll know that your title is going to be $5,000 in production cost. There isn't a hard and fast rule for what people are going to charge. So again, working with the vendor or the narrator uh, that you're comfortable with um, and making sure it, it fits the budget you have in mind is important. We're back to 
in optimizing those internal and external resources. What can you outsource and what are you comfortable bringing in-house? There's a big learning curve for everything from formatting the file uh, to the metadata for audiobooks. Uh, and I'll say it again, I've said it before, you cannot spend enough time and money on the quality control. So having a good editor and a good person doing your post-production who knows how to master for the various retails you need are going to be key to success. As you're preparing your audiobook catalog, uh, you are going to want to be thinking about pricing. Generally, publishers establish a pricing grid. So you say, if my book is going to be between six and 10 hours, I'm going to charge X price. Uh, there's a lot of factors to consider in there, so you'll want to do some research, um, especially around the models that you're going to sell in. Are you planning to really focus your retailers uh, or focus on retailers who sell on a download uh, you know, per credit model? Or are you looking more at retailers that are selling on that um, unlimited un subscription model? That can impact you know, how you price things and how you're thinking about things. The other thing that you will need for an audiobook is different artwork. Most of the audiobook retailers are looking for square artwork, 2400 by 2400, 300 DPI. Your designer can certainly do that, but it's very different from the um, kind of vertical length of the ebook artwork. Obviously, you have to consider formats. Um, are you going to make your titles available in CD? That's a different mastering process than digital because you have to consider those CD breaks. Uh, are you going to make apps of your titles? And if you are, you have to think about making it available in Android, in Windows, and in Apple. And that can be a totally different process. Also, um, are you selling with digital rights management or not with digital rights management? Most audiobook vendors today sell MP3 files, uh, so making sure that you have the option of selling without digital rights management uh, per your contracts will ensure that you can be available at more vendors. And then metadata. There are no standards per retailer um, in audiobook metadata. So your two options are, of course, delivering to FTPs with their Excel template formats. Uh, there's only about two dozen audio vendors at this point. Uh, and if you're working with a distributor, you may go to one point, and they would distribute to all of those vendors for you. Or you can distribute via Onyx feed. The Onyx feed obviously is really nice because if you have an update, um, I had a case recently where the author made new artwork and decided to change the subtitle of their ebook. So we wanted to match that with the audio, but that means I have to put the artwork on 20 different FTPs and do 20 different Excel templates to update that information. If I was using an Onyx feed, I could just put it in uh, and it would go into the Delta feed, which would be a lot more efficient. Sales and marketing activities, um, especially when you're selling content outside of your own established market, are really going to be about um, establishing relationships and looking at things that work well. So simultaneous release, so you list with the book. Uh, sending your title out for review. There are not a ton of places to review both books and audio. Uh, and in fact, there's a whole list of audiobook bloggers and audiobook reviewers. And there is, in fact, a magazine, Audiophile magazine, that is dedicated um, just to audiobooks. So you want to make sure you establish those relationships so you can be um, ensuring your titles get reviewed. And the big difference in working with audio is that you have two artists 
not just the author, but also, also the narrator. Uh, they will often agree to be involved in putting the word out about your title. And in hiring a well-established narrator, you're actually getting their fan base who are willing to oftentimes buy really whatever they record. As you look at um, all the retailers, you're really going to need to think about what you're comfortable with. Again, DRM free, that's digital rights management free. Are you comfortable with the unlimited streaming model? And in the library, are you comfortable with the pay per circulation model? Typically in libraries, it had been that the library would buy a single digital copy uh, at a particular library price, and then when someone wants to take out that copy, they have to go in the queue. Uh, and if I've got seven people ahead of me in the queue, I have to wait until they're done with the, the digital copy and have essentially returned it before I can take it out. Now we're seeing, seeing the emergence of the pay per circ model where a library can make a title available to its patrons. Any patron can go in and take out that title and you will receive revenue each time they take out the title. Obviously the per circulation fee that you will get will be less than if they just bought the title and make people queue up for it. So you want to think about all those things uh, as you move forward in looking at your available rights and in who you want to partner with to sell titles. Overall, it's great news for audiobooks. We're seeing increases across the world and we're seeing emergence of um, markets all over the world. So let's take a look at really what are the most established markets. Uh, for the most part, it's the English-speaking markets, the US, the UK, and Australia. We mentioned about $2.1 billion in the US. Uh, in the UK, it's estimated to be about a $130 million market. Um, certainly, South Africa, New Zealand, um, and of course Canada um, are all places where English audiobooks will do well. We also see Germany as being a sweet spot for audiobooks. It tends to be German language books that do well there. They have a robust um, about a $400 million audio market. They are still heavily in the CD market. They're about five to seven years behind the US in terms of that digital transition. Uh, and they have more abridgments and full cast dramatizations in their market. Let's look at what's emerging. Um, certainly Sweden, about four to five percent of the publishing market there goes to audio and they predict that this is going to grow to about eight percent in very short order. In France, it's still pretty small, it's about one percent of publishing overall, uh, but we're starting to see things happening in Asia and in Japan there's about a 45 million dollar market for audiobooks. What's happening in the rest of the world? Well, um, Russia is starting to see some audiobook vendors emerge, and a lot's happening in the Arab countries. In Jordan, last year, Masmu actually launched, and we have in Dubai launching soon, Book Lava. Both of those places are encouraging Arab publishers to have their own stuff recorded and they are doing some of their own recording to ensure that they have robust collections in their language and they're also looking at offering uh, English speaking titles as well. And we talked a little bit about Spain before. Uh, Storytel Spain um, has certainly encouraged what's happening in Spain. Uh, U-Book in South America is emerging. And so we expect to see a lot more happening in the Spanish market. Um, I certainly know we get a lot more requests now at the Audio Publishers Association to establish a Spanish uh, award for the Audio Awards, which are kind of like the Oscars of the audio publishing world. Um, that was 
an existing award a number of years ago, but the submissions had dropped off to the point where it didn't make sense to continue. And now people are starting to produce more uh, and request that the, the Audio Publishers Association maybe look at bringing that back. So when we start to see noise like that, um, we know that there's a lot more publishing happening. The APA is a great resource. Um, of course, if you go to their page that's listed on the um, PowerPoint there, they have a lot of information about past sales and consumer surveys. Only members have access to the full um, data, but there's a lot of good information on the site, and we, of course, encourage members from across the globe. Uh, and a number of things that Gabrielle has been putting in the chat box um, are available at the Audio Publishers Industry Getting Started page, where you have those studios, do-it-yourself platforms, and distributors who can help make your audio program a success. <laughs> 